You, know, you often hear farmers saying, well, you know, if people, if people understood what we were doing, they'd be more sympathetic towards us. Bullshit. You know, if people really understood what it takes to produce that bacon and that butter and, 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 and that beef and the rest of it, the chicken especially, it would be far less. In fact, not only would they be unsympathetic, they would just stop buying it. How do we feed the world without devouring the planet? Well, I think the most important thing is to start off by recognizing that when we say farming, actually we're talking now about three almost entirely separate industries which operate on different principles and supply different markets. Horticulture, fruit and vegetable production. Um, um, grain, which means cereals, oil seeds and legumes, um, peas and beans, and livestock. And we really need to consider them separately because they pretty well operate completely separately now and there are entirely different approaches needed in each one. Very briefly, horticulture, well, there are definitely some virtues to the Dutch model. You know, we're talking about very low land use. There is definitely um, been a reduction per kilo of produce of inputs. It's not going fast enough. Um, it's still putting far too much load on the living world, particularly the pesticide um, use and the pesticide leakage from horticulture. Um, there are other ways entirely. Um, I've been following a fascinating grower in the United Kingdom called Ian Tolhurst, who across the course of 34 years has designed a system where his yields have risen, um, uh, his soil fertility has risen, until even though he's on poor land, he's hit the lower bound of what conventional producers um, 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 produce on, on, on much better land without any fertilizers and any manure or pesticides or herb, her herbicides. No one quite understands how he's done it. Some people have been able to replicate what he's done, some people haven't. But a crucial aspect of, of his system is adding a tiny amount of carbon in the form of wood chip at, cert at, at one point in the rotation. Um, a point when the soil is covered by green manures. He keeps his soil covered at all times to prevent um, uh, the nutrients from leaching away. And he adds a tiny amount of wood chip, um, averages out at one millimeter per year, at a key part of the rotation. And what this seems to be doing, though we don't really understand the mechanisms, is tweaking the relationship between plants and the bacteria and fungi, which are absolutely crucial to the delivery of nutrients to them. It works, we don't yet know how it works because of the grotesque underfunding of soil science. You know, it should be perhaps the most important science on earth. Um, it's so crucial, it's absolutely essential to our well-being, and yet the money available for it is tiny. Here we are spending billions of dollars on the Mars rover program to investigate the surface of that planet. Wouldn't it be quite a good idea to spend billions of dollars investigating the surface of our own? because it's almost a black box. We know so little about soil. What we know is fascinating, extraordinary, mind-blowing. I mean, it doesn't behave like any other ecosystem. It's got all sorts of properties, which are just, it's like an alien life form. It's just extraordinary. We can hardly get your head around it. And yet, you know, we're only just at the beginning of an understanding of what we're dealing with there. And it, this guy in Tolhurst, Tolly, has, has, has in some ways anticipated recent developments in soil ecology and he's understood that it's all about that the bacterial fungal plant relationships um, but you know we need to know why he succeeded and and we don't we don't at the moment that should be an absolutely key research priority but there's no money then there's grain production and and you know we are going to need i mean we need to eat more fruit and veg um, and i believe that fruit and veg should be subsidized at the point of sale because um, they're just far too expensive for many people to buy. Um, but we will also need to continue to eat cereals and, 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 um, and be beans and pulses and oil crops. We'll still need them. Whatever else changes, though that we might um, need to vary the, the, the proportions. And we have you know, another massive form of damage here. And in fact, there's very few ways at the moment in which we can reach that holy grail 
of high yields and low impacts, because that's what we should be aiming for everywhere. We get the yields that you get from intensive farming and the low impacts that you get from, um, from, from extensive farming, but you bring those two things together. So you get intensive yields and low impacts, which is absolutely crucial if we're to feed the world without sprawling across vast areas of it. And, and one very exciting potential development in grain production is a switch from annual crops to perennial crops. Now, almost all the grain we eat worldwide comes from annual crops. In other words, from plants which live and die within one year. And large areas covered by annual plants are, are rare in nature and they tend to occur only in the wake of an ecological disaster. So a volcanic eruption or a landslide or a major fire. And, and these um, uh, annual um, plants are specialists in quickly colonizing an area of, of bare land. They reproduce very quickly, they fill it up as fast as they can, and then the perennials, the long-lasting plants, will come in and smother them, and, and their seeds will stay in the soil until another disaster comes along. So in order to produce our annual crops, we have to create an ecological disaster every year. Uh, we have to plough the land or spray the land. We have to kill everything which is on it already in order to create a seed bed for our crops. And then having sown the seed, we need to pamper the, the baby plants as they're, as they're growing and give them fertiliser and, and herbicide to kill any competing weeds and pesticide to kill anything which might eat them and, and lots of water to, to make sure that they can, they can get established. And then they grow for, for a few weeks and then we harvest them and then we start all over again. And this, you know, this is what's driving soil degradation. It's what's driving the, the huge flux of farm chemicals into the living world. So what if we could continue to harvest from the same plants without having to sow them every year? Well, if you could do that, and the plants get much better established, the you know, perennial plants have much deeper roots, they have tougher above ground structures, they're much better at getting their own water, at getting their own nutrients, they're likely to be more resistant to pests, they are, are will quickly smother any weeds which want to compete with them because they'll occupy the ground and keep it occupied, and they're likely to be more resistant to environmental shocks because of those deep roots and tough structures. It's been a dream of scientists for about a century and finally it's being realised. So uh, led by the Land Institute in, in, in Kansas, um, in conjunction with other research departments around the world, um, they are scanning um, um, uh, uh, thousands of potential candidates for perennial crops. We should be looking, casting the net as wide as possible looking for neglected grains, which maybe some people are already growing, or grains which have got agricultural potential that no one is yet growing. And, and they have brought one of these to, to full commercialization in conjunction with the University of Yunnan in southern China, which is a variety of short grain rice romantically named PR23. And uh, they crossed annual short grain rice with perennial, a wild perennial rice and very quickly managed to develop a variety which has the same yields as annual rice for several years in a row from one plant. Um, and this is a massive breakthrough. Um, farmers in Yunnan are desperate for the seed. Um, one, because um, the soil erosion caused by annual ploughing is making a lot of their terraces just fall off the hillside. But two, because they've got a massive labour shortage there as the young people have moved to the cities. And if you only have to plant it every few years rather than every year, then you've greatly cut your labour costs as well as all the other potential inputs. Um, the, the Land Institute is, is growing loads of perennial wheat, um, um, different per, um, perennial cereals, um, perennial sunflowers. And in fact, it's, it's, um, it's perennial sunflower um, experimental block um, grows next to um, annual sunflowers for, for comparison. Um, recently, they had a severe drought. 
completely knocked out the annual sunflowers. All of them died and the perennials just sailed through because their roots were down so much deeper. And you know, our farming now needs to be environmentally resilient. We desperately need to find crops which are going to survive shocks like droughts and storms and, and the rest of it because there's going to be a lot more of those. So that's one of many very promising potential routes for, for grain farming, but yet again, massively underfunded. I mean, being led by the Land Institute, which is a small NGO based in a, in a farmhouse in, in, in Salina, Kansas. You know, we should, government should be all over this. There should be billions put in this. This is an existential issue. But perhaps the most important of all these issues is livestock and the uh, protein-rich and fat-rich foods that we obtain from livestock. Because of all those impacts I've talked about, by far and away, the great majority are caused by farm animals. Even though farm animals in total produce just 18% of our calories, they produce the great majority of the environmental damage. And nowadays, you know, we, we have a storybook image of where our meat and milk and eggs come from, it bears no relationship at all to the reality. The great majority of the animal products that, that if any of you still eat them, are coming from is, is factories, is intensively farmed animals in this brutal system. If we treated this lovely creature in the same way that we treat pigs and chickens, we would be sent to prison. It's an extraordinary thing. We call ourselves animal lovers. We are animal lovers. Who doesn't love this? <laughs> Look, uh, we, we love, you know, we love animals. When we allow ourselves to love animals, we love animals. And yet we kill 76 million of them. Uh, sorry, billion of them. 76 billion every year to feed ourselves. I mean, think about the scale of that slaughter. 76 billion animals. And the great majority are treated appallingly before they go to, to the slaughterhouse. And, and, and the vast majority of these animal products come from places where you're not allowed to go, you're not allowed to look at it. You, know, you often hear farmers saying, well, you know, if people, if people understood what we were doing, they'd be more sympathetic towards us. Bullshit! You know, if people really understood what it takes to produce that bacon and that butter and, 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 and that beef and the rest of it, the chicken especially, it would be far less. In fact, not only would they be unsympathetic, they would just stop buying it. There was a survey in the United States where 95% of people asked meat, 95% uh, of people eat meat, in which 47% people, 47 of people said they wanted to ban slaughterhouses. Yeah, we're just, we're so split, we, we, we're in, in a state of permanent cognitive dissonance over this enormous issue. Now, intensively farmed animals, no river can survive intensive animal farming. Wherever you've got a concentration of intensive animals, your rivers die. And that's because of the huge nutrient flux going into those rivers. Those animals need to be fed on grain, whose production incidentally is absolutely devastating. And I'm very sorry that Rabobank, which is the sponsor of these talks, I found this out yesterday to my great distress, is um, funding soy plantations, palm oil plantations, beef in the Amazon, a whole series of absolute horror stories. Now, it spins a good line. It spins a good line and it says it wants to do good. Well, the most important thing in all environmental issues is the bad things you stop doing rather than the good things you start doing. And if you're going to do good, you've got to start, stop doing the bad stuff first. And it has to get out. It has to divest from these highly destructive industries. And the great majority of soy production goes into our pigs and chickens. That's what it's for. Very 7% goes into products for direct human consumption like tofu or tempeh. The great majority is, is for animal production and it's highly inefficient because you lose most of, of the food value. But then a lot of those nutrients are lost too because the animals poop them out. Um, and, and where you get these concentrations of intensive animal farms, there's simply far too much shit. Broadly speaking, the world is too full of shit. And, um, and, and, it's, and, and, and this is you know, overwhelmingly because of, of intensive animal farming. That, that has to go somewhere. 
Um, it's, it's high volume, low value, so you can't truck it more than about five or 10 kilometers before it's not worth the diesel to move it. So you spread it close by and farmers spread it on their own fields, but there's far too much for the soil or the plants to absorb. And so the majority washes off into the rivers. It causes <coughs> algal blooms, which photosynthesize by day and bring oxygen into the water column, but respire at night and draw the oxygen out of the water column and everything asphyxiates. And very quickly, you get the global standard river forming, which is hostile to almost all forms of life except sewage fungus. And we see it happening in beautiful river systems all over the world. And then conversely, no terrestrial system can survive productive, ex extensive animal farming because it, it's, it has to destroy the great majority of, of ecological resources in order to produce any appreciable amount of milk or meat. So there's just no good way of doing it. There's no good way of producing significant amounts of animal products without screwing the living planet and screwing our chances of survival. So I'd like to introduce what I think is the most important environmental technology ever developed, which is right at the beginning of, of, of its, well, it hasn't, I mean, right at the beginning of commercialization and right at the top of its cost curve. Animal farming, by the way, is right at the bottom of its cost curve. This is why it's doing even worse things all the time to animals, like injecting cows with bovine growth hormones and injecting pigs with ractopamine to try to extract a tiny bit more cost saving from them, but you can't. You push those multicellular organisms to their absolute limits. But this new technology is right at the top of the cost curve and has tremendous potential for a, a massive decline in price and a massive increase in scale. And this is new forms of fermentation. Now, fermentation is very old. We've been doing it since before the dawn of agriculture, but now we're beginning to do it more precisely. In fact, we've been doing it quite precisely for about 40 years, um, since 1978. Um, insulin has been produced by yeast or bacteria, um, um, which have been engineered to produce that specific product, and it's massively more efficient and kinder than mashing up pig's pancreases, which is where it previously came from, and you get a better kind of insulin also. Um, if you eat cheese, you almost certainly eat chymosin, which is the replacement for rennet, the substance used to coagulate cheese, which was previously extracted from the fourth stomach of an unweaned calf, um, sliced up and macerated and chemically degraded in order to, to, to extract it. Sounds like a missing ingredient from Macbeth. Um, and, um, and, and now comes from um, genetically modified yeast or bacteria. And since the 1980s, we've been getting it that way. Um, same with vitamin B12. In fact, any vitamin supplements or vitamin additions um, to the foods you eat, they come from this same root. But the really exciting thing now is that we're beginning to use these, the, these more refined forms of fermentation to produce protein-rich and fat-rich foods. And because microbes breed so fast, need so little by comparison to multicellular life. Um, and, and, and we have scarcely even begun to explore the potential for selective breeding of them. We have this tremendous opportunity here to shrink the footprint of, of protein-rich and fat-rich food production to a dot. So um, the, some of these uh, microbes require no agricultural substrate at all, no farm products whatsoever. Um, they can feed, for instance, on hydrogen or methanol, both of which can be um, produced from renewable energy. Um, and in fact, Adnan here, who's um, pioneering um, methanol-based fermentation um, with your farmless company that he, he set up, uh, makes a very persuasive case for why, why, why methanol is actually a better route than hydrogen. Yes. But, but they can both, and you can ask him about this after, in fact, if, if someone asks me a question about this, I will say that's such an easy question, Adnan can answer it. <laughs> and a study in, um, in Sweden by uh, Thomas Linder, a scientist there, um, showed that if you um, use um, uh, uh, methanol-consuming bacteria 
to produce protein, uh, you need 1,700 times less land than you do um, if you're using the most um, efficient means of agricultural protein production, which is soy in the US. And what that means, if you compare soy production to beef production, is you use 138,000 times less land than you do to produce protein from beef. This is revolutionary. I mean, start to picture what this means. You know, we could effectively retire all animal farming and still feed the world far more effectively than we do with animals. And that means we could rewild the planet on a massive scale, ecological restoration on a previously unimaginable scale, bringing back the forests, bringing back the wetlands, bringing back the savannas, bringing back the wild grasslands, bringing back the mangroves, the sea floors, the reefs, the kelp forests, and in doing so, stopping the sixth great extinction in its tracks and drawing down vast amounts of the carbon that we've already released into the atmosphere. We now know it's too late just to decarbonize our economies. We need to do that, and urgently, but even if we do that, we will certainly exceed 1.5 degrees, almost certainly two degrees, even if we decarbonize everything. We also have to draw down some of the carbon already in the atmosphere, and by far, the quickest, cheapest, and most benign way of doing that is global rewilding. And so we have this tremendous potential to shrink the land footprint, also the water footprint, also the fertilizer footprint, with contained systems which don't spill out into the ecosystem as agriculture does. We have this potential to move farming, uh, move food production off the farm and into the factory. Now I hear people say, factory? I don't want to get food from a factory. Well, almost everything you eat passes through a factory at at least one point in its production. And if you eat animals, you are almost certainly eating uh, food which has been in a factory throughout its entire life, except for the grain which was brought to the animals. In fact, you could argue that the entire um, agricultural surface of the planet is being turned into a vast, sprawling factory. Wouldn't it be better to minimize that, to reduce that, to accept that the factory is the end product of an efficiency drive because it makes everything easier and quicker and uses less resources. And given that in this case, we can move from a factories of horror, factories in which the pigs are crammed and the chickens are crammed in unimaginable conditions, to factories where no harm is done to any animal at all, and factories where no poo is spilling out into the ecosystem, what, what do we lose by, by, by making that shift? And I thought the really difficult thing was going to be translating this into meat-like products. Dairy is relatively easy. You know, there's a couple of proteins you have to get right, casein, whey proteins, a few lipids, and the rest is water. You know, if you're in dairy farming, get out now, because that's going to be very quick and easy. Um, um, eggs are harder to crack, but, you know, the egg proteins, um, um, a, a lot of egg proteins are actually extracted from eggs and sold separately for, for um, industrial uses. And so you can straight away um, take that part of the market out and it wouldn't be difficult to reconstruct something quite egg-like. But I always thought meat was going to be the really difficult thing to get realistic meat-like products because I don't think cell-cultured meat, where, you know, you grow your steak on a collagen scaffold in a, in a bioreactor, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think it's just too expensive. There's too many steps. So what can we do um, to turn these new protein sources into something which is just like meat. Because, you know, I, I would love it if everyone ate pulses and leafy greens like I do, because everyone wants people to be like them. But that's not the way the world is going. You know, people talk about the, the population crisis, right? And they mean the human population crisis. But actually, human population is about the only environmental indicator which is plateauing. All the others are doing this. Human population would probably level off in mid-century. It's growing at 1% a year. There is a population crisis. It's a livestock population. It's growing at 2.4% a year. To put it in crude terms, by 2050, there'll be 100 million tons of extra human being on Earth and 400 million tons of extra livestock on Earth. Already, by weight, only 4% of the world's mammals are wild. 36% of them are people and, well, these things, and 60% and are livestock. 
And it's going to be even worse if we stay on that trajectory. We have to stop that from happening. And the only way to do that is to bring meat and other livestock products in at below the cost of meat from animals and milk from animals and eggs from animals. It's a price which is going to make the argument. I can make all the moral arguments in the world. Yeah, and I do you know, on social media. And I get bombarded with all these Texans saying, look at the ribeye steak I ate today. Ha, 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 soy boy, stick that in your nose. You know, and it's like, you know, and you know, you, you're not going to persuade people that way. But you bring the price, you get the price below the price of animal products and animal products are finished, gone, dead. That's the end of the industry. The end of an industry which is more damaging to the world than fossil fuels because it hits so many different ecosystems right the way across the board. The most damaging industry of all, we can bring that to an end. But how do you get the texture right? How do you make it like meat? And I thought this was going to be the most difficult of all problems. When I was in Stockholm um, a couple of days ago, all by train, I hasten to add. And, and while I was there, um, I was invited to a restaurant to try um, this steak. And it was terrifying because as a vegan, I kept thinking I shouldn't be eating this. There's something wrong here. This is appalling. It was, it had, the texture was exactly that. It was, it was this fibrous, it was just like meat. And it's made by this company in Slovenia, slightly embarrassing name of Juicy Marbles. God knows why. Um, and, uh, but it's entirely made of plants and they use some sort of 3D construction thing. I don't know exactly what. And it's expensive. It's at the top of the, the, the um, price curve. And it's got a long list of ingredients because it's all plants and plant proteins are very different to animal proteins. Plant fats are very different. Um, they're mixed up with all these secondary compounds which create strong flavors and things. Plant material is not good. It's not a great, great um, set of ingredients for making animal-like substances, but microbial proteins and fats. You've got much more to play with. You've, you've, you can create amino acid profiles, which are very, very similar to those of meat. You plug that into these new texturing um, te te technologies. You radically shorten your ingredients list. You need far less, uh, far less processing. You can produce products which are healthier than animal products because you can exclude some of the things which give us heart disease and all the rest. And before very long, we'll be bringing them in at below the price. And the potential for this to change the world is monumental, greater than any technology that we've played with so far, much greater than solar panels. So those are going to be important because that's where the renewable energy is going to come from. And they're going through step changes too, than wind turbines and all the other things that we've quite rightly been championing as environmentalists. But this is, is the biggest potential change of all. And the most exciting possibility here is the triggering of a techno-ethical shift. And a techno-ethical shift is where a, a technology unlocks an ethical change. So if you think of the printing press and the replacement of parchment with paper, when those two things came together in Europe, bang! the Reformation, religious revolution, political revolution, and still the reverberations are going through Europe today. What happened is you had the, the technological potential to make real people's dreams of change. You lifted the lid on, on latent disquiet, on latent revolution. And having lifted the lid, you couldn't put the lid back on. So similarly, with the pill and other modern reproductive technologies, which, which greatly accelerated the cause of women's liberation. Of course, still a very, very long way to go, but it, 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 it lifted the lid again on that desire for change. And what happens is that as soon as a situation becomes amendable, that is the moment at which it becomes intolerable. Only when we know we can change it and change it easily, do we suddenly say, uh, so why are we doing it this way? And the moment we can produce products which are almost indistinguishable from, just as good as and cheaper than the animal products we eat today, we'll start asking, why aren't we treating animals like that um, rather than the way we treat the pigs and the chickens and the cows? Why are we killing 76 billion animals to sate our appetites? And then this techno-ethical shift 
feeds into cultural shifts. It feeds into social shifts. It feeds into political shifts. It gives us the space to create the world we want to see. And then change at that moment, if we use it cleverly. We still need the politics. You know, the technology isn't enough. We need the the political change, the economic change, the social change, the cultural change alongside this. It's not enough just to say technology, but if we use this right, if we move into the space politically, using direct action, using all the tools, the very effective tools of activism that have been developed, which are the core of politics, if we move into that space, then change becomes not just possible, not just probable. Change becomes inevitable. Thank you.